Welcome to the Commerce Lab, where every week we sit down with top performing consumer brands and leaders to understand what drives their success. How did they hit their first million, the first 20 million, the first 100 million? What strategies are working for them today that you should be testing and what's not working that you should be avoiding? This isn't just a podcast. It's the business school for brand operators. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Commerce Lab. I'm Alan Burt, and today we have a guest who is someone that I've been wanting to talk to, frankly, because he has a very contrarian view of how to scale a brand. He has, uh, at this point, scaled into multiple seven figures, around the mid seven figures in revenue, uh, completely bootstrapped. So he's never raised outside venture capital of of, of any kind. He also has built his team to be 100% remote from day one. And the guy that we're interviewing today is a guy by the name of Fred Perota. And he's the founder, or I should say co-founder of Tortuga Backpacks. That's tortugabackpacks.com. So today, what we did is we broke down and, 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 and talked to Fred about how he start the business? How did he scale it up? And specifically, what were those main inflection points along the way where capital and capital constraints became a big problem? And having not raised outside funding, how was he able to overcome those capital restraints and fund things like inventory? And how was he able to put money into or time into marketing and fund salaries, right? So, if you're a brand who's taking a more of a bootstrap approach or you would like to take a bootstrap approach as you continue to scale, this is a fantastic interview to understand how Fred has been able to scale the Tortuga Backpacks brand into a multi-million dollar, you know, mid seven figures brand without raising any capital and how to do it while building a remote team at the exact same time. So without further ado, I'll give you Fred Perota of Tortuga Backpacks. Hey, Fred, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So just to give everybody a little bit of context uh, before we get into the nitty gritty details, can you give everybody just a very quick introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm the co-founder of Tortuga, and we help travelers avoid the cost and the hassle of checking luggage by making carry-on size travel backpacks. It's kind of the the category that we started in um, and found this this problem and this opportunity on a backpacking trip to Europe with my co-founder. That's awesome. And I've got, and, and the reason I brought you on is I, I, I know you have a very contrarian point of view when it comes to scaling a physical products e-commerce brand. And so that's what we're going to be diving in today is, is talking about uh, specifically how you bootstrap the brand, how you scaled it to where it is now, which from what I understand is in sort of the mid seven figures uh, of revenue annual. Um, so I'm going to dive into all that in just a second, but just on a personal note, uh, I love what you guys do because I did a ton of traveling when I was in my you know very very early twenties, uh, backpacked across Europe. You know, you know, was in finance for a couple of years, then quit my job and ended up backpacking around the world for an entire year. So I know exactly the the use case that you guys solve for, and I'm your market, or at least I was your market back when I was a little bit younger. Um, so I, I love what you guys do. I think it's very very cool. You know, we like helping people in those moments where they're just like, screw it, I'm leaving, and they go I'm backpacking done. or <laughs> take some long trip. That's, uh, that's when a lot of people find us. It, it can be a rocky point in, in their life, but it can also be uh, a really positive one, too. It is. And I think, I think those folks that do that, too, they develop this uh, affinity towards back, back, you know, backpacks or packs. Like my wife will be the first to say, like, I have more backpacks than she has purses because I'm constantly trying to buy a new one or looking for a new one just because I'm obsessed with it. Uh, so I, I totally get the market cause I am, I am the market. Um, but let's, let's sort of turn back the tape, you know, the time here and let's, let's look at sort of when you guys were first starting the brand, you had this initial concept, this idea, you know, was it because there just wasn't a good backpack in the market or did you guys just see a need for a brand that sort of spoke differently to the customer or what was sort of that catalyst point where like, Oh, we have to build Tortuga. A little bit of both of what you just said. So, uh, we went on this trip in 2009. Uh, took a couple of weeks to go backpacking in Europe. Um, and before the trip, we were doing all of our research. We're kind of the, the nerdy researcher gear type, uh, gearhead types, like you said you are. Um, and we just couldn't find the right bag for that kind of trip. So uh, we were doing research online. I was going to the REI store, um, North Face store, all this stuff. And, you know, it was a backpacking trip. So we wanted backpacks, not suitcases. Uh, but everything that uh, all these bags that a backpacker usually carries, that uh, that caricature you have of them in your head, staying at hostels, 
those are really hiking bags that they're typically carrying um, yep. just because they're big and it's a backpack. That's kind of why people buy them. Um, but we went on this trip and figured out why those didn't really work well for travel. You know, they're made for hiking, not for traveling. So uh, what we saw was that they were kind of a pain to pack and unpack. So you got to dump everything out, find what you need, repack the whole thing. So uh, basically our idea was uh, we wanted to make a bag that was carried like a backpack and was comfortable. Uh, but that you could open up like a suitcase, get to all your stuff, keep it organized and kind of make a, a hybrid of those two without the, uh, usually the hybrid is like uh, really a suitcase you could throw in your back and that is not comfortable and very painful. Nope. So when to kind of go the other way with, with the hybrids. Um, so the, the first kind of insight was that that product didn't really exist and didn't really work in the way that a traveler needed it to. Uh, and then the second one, as we came back and did even more research into this idea, was that there were some things kind of vaguely in that world, um, but there was no one was really focused on it. So some of your outdoor brands had maybe one bag that was sort of worked like that, um, but you know their focus is outdoors. They they're not going to invest a ton of focus on this one skew that they have. So we also kind of saw an opportunity that uh, we could take this idea. And our bet was this this product, or this uh, category, could be its own company. It's not just one SKU that Osprey or REI or whoever makes. Uh, we bet that we could take that one SKU, focus entirely on that, and that could be a business in and of itself. Yeah, I used a Kelty when I was when I did my my travels and my trips. Kelty, and then I had a smaller Deuter I used. But you're right; they they were built for backpacking, and you'd have to stuff your all your clothes in from the very top of the bag, and there was no sort of like midpoint accessibility to pull things out and without having to completely refold everything. So I, I totally get the get the pain point. When you guys went and saw this, decided to build it, did you release sort of one skew? Did you release multiple at the same time? Did you do like a Kickstarter? How did you guys launch the product? Uh, we started single SKU, and uh, even though people often tell us they found us through Kickstarter, but we've never actually run one, so uh, you know, they're, I'm not sure what what they're remembering. But uh, yeah, we, we so we started in 2009. By the time we launched, it was uh, 2011, and back then we didn't even really know about Kickstarter. It existed uh, in retrospect; uh, it did exist, but it just wasn't uh, what it became later. So. Um, yeah, we were trying to do this all on our own without Kickstarter. Our, our blueprint at the time was the book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim mm-hmm. Ferriss, which, right. um, you know, he talks a lot about uh, physical product businesses and these kind of like autopilot passive income type businesses. And that, that was the blueprint we were following originally. Now there's so many direct-to-consumer retail brands, uh, excuse me, and that has that category. They have their own playbook now. Uh, but we were using kind of a totally different one, uh, you know, now almost 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, we basically had one product idea, one SKU, and the original idea was to follow that book, uh, the four hour work week and, uh, basically have a, a business. We would run some ads to it. Money would come in, would be reinvested in the ads and we'd have this little autopilot kind of side business. But, um, yeah, by the time we launched it, uh, and, eventually had some traction later on um our our ambitions kind of grew as as our success did so uh as that product started to work we kind of thought like well we can we can make some more products we actually have some more ideas now and maybe we can bring some more people into the team so uh, we kind of started from that for our work week place but uh kind of sort of scaled it up from there so let's talk about what what was sort of those main levers you guys used to hit your first you know seven figures in revenue, your first sort of million uh, in revenue in, in a year. Was it mainly advertising? Was it PR? What was sort of the main that main you know main lever that you guys yanked on to to hit that? Yeah, so we thought it would be advertising uh, before we started the company. I was working at Google and running ads for all kinds of businesses. Uh, and then as we got going, I left that and was doing consulting, doing the same kind of work uh, on Google and Facebook ads. So uh, I was coming from that being a strength and was most of my uh, kind of real world working experience. Uh, but what we quickly found out was those didn't work well for us uh, because of two things. One, a higher price point. Um, when we originally launched, the backpack was 200 bucks. So that doesn't work as well on an impulse buy where, you know, you search for a backpack, you see that, click the ad and, you know, buy right then. So um, that was a bit of a barrier for us. 
And then the other part was the very first product we launched was just pretty ugly. Um, we, uh, we eventually reached a point uh, in the initial development where we, we had the product fairly far along. It wasn't quite what we wanted yet, but we hit a point where it was either we have to launch what we have or we're going to run out of money in development and never be able to <laughs> afford a production order. So right. uh, we thought it was better to launch something than nothing. Uh, so the very first version of the bag was pretty ugly. So even if we got people coming in through those uh, through those ads, they were not buying. Uh, they were bouncing very quickly once they saw the product. So um, yeah, the so what we started doing during that time was a little bit of everything, uh, but it was really our content marketing and blogging uh, that kind of got some initial traction. So that started building up a bit of readership, getting some traffic from Google. Um, and we did sell enough bags, not very many, but enough that the feedback we got back was generally positive. So uh, what we learned from that was that uh, the insights we had about how the product should work and features and all that were, were right on. The people who were so desperate they did buy the bag despite its looks uh, were happy with it. So we knew that we, there was enough there that we should keep going and we eventually redesigned that product. So. Uh, by the time we you know, spent a couple of years, got the new version out uh, and had been working on that blogging and content marketing all along, um, those two things then started to kind of grow in tandem a bit. So uh, really, we hit that uh, first uh, kind of seven figure mark, uh, mostly through uh, blogging and, and content marketing. And how long did it take to, to get to that point? Um, I guess I'd have to double check what year exactly we hit it. But... That was probably something like five years total, but a lot okay. of that was, uh, you know, that wasn't like five years for the blog to grow enough. That was more five years to like, how do we make a product? How right. do we sell the right. product? Like right. uh, this was before, again, there were many playbooks on this stuff. So yeah, we, we spent, uh, I don't want to say wasted, but spent the first couple of years uh, just kind of learning what the heck we were doing and doing all of that through trial and error. So um, 2013, we relaunched the product um, or launched the redesigned one. Uh, by then, the the blog had a little bit momentum, so a bit of momentum. So heading into that next year, um, kind of that combination plus some scarcity, uh, which was accidental and um, uh, due to what we could afford to order at one time, which uh, I guess kind of plays nicely into uh, what you wanted to talk about today, but. Um, all of those things kind of came together in 2014. And I think that'd probably be the year that we, uh, we initially had seven figures. Okay. So let's talk about that. Cause it, again, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on and talk about sort of your approach is because you do have a very contrarian approach, which is very different than a lot of other brands that we talk to that, you know, they, they maybe launched with something like a Kickstarter or they went out and raised a seed round of financing or after they hit their first million, they went out and raised a round of, um, a round of money to, to scale the business, um, and to fund things like inventory in e-commerce, right, and, and everybody who's listening to this operates in, in the physical product space, uh, understands the the sort of the capital constraints that come with with growing a physical products brand. Even though you're operating and selling online, um, or at least majority online, you still have physical product, right? You have to design, you have to manufacture, you have to store inventory, right? And that requires, you know, capital uh, to, to do so. And so it's one of the big sort of constraints with bootstrapping is how do you actually afford to continue to scale at each of these inflection points as demand continues to increase, how do you afford things like inventory, but still be able to, to plow those profits back into things like advertising to, to continue growth? So what I'd love to do is kind of break down a little bit here with you. What were those main sort of inflection points and how did you guys solve the capital constraint problem as you hit each of them? So like, you know, the very beginning, you know, how did you guys fund a sort of the initial product design and product run? And then after you guys saw some initial success, how did you guys view, you know, raising capital or using profits to fund to that next big milestone? Yeah. So early on, we were doing everything out of pocket. Um, and the first time we used any other kind of money was for our first production run, um, or I guess leading up to it. Um, so we got some money from an organization called the JFLA, which is the Jewish Free Loan Association. And yes, they give actually interest-free loans. Uh, I don't totally understand why or how it works. <laughs> we're, just, we're just grateful to have found it. Um, do they still do that? It, 
Uh, I believe they're still around. They have chapters in a bunch of different cities. Uh, okay. so we were working with the LA chapter back then. Um, okay. on, and weirdly enough, only some of them actually require you to be Jewish to participate. So it's kind of a, it's a strange setup. Uh, again, I don't understand how it works. We're just grateful to have found it because it was one of the few sources, um, one, just any kind of source of money uh, without a track record. Um, you can often get uh, good rates from a bank, though, of course, they're going to charge you some interest, um, which is uh, worse than none. But most of the conventional ways uh, of getting money or a loan or whatever require at least a year or two of profitability. Mm -hmm. um, which makes it really hard when you're starting out, right? So this is why people are raising money or using Kickstarter. Those are the only uh, only mechanisms you have to really get started. Um, so we used the JFLA on that initial order. Uh, a few years later, by the time we were redesigning the product, uh, get ready, getting ready for our next production run, uh, we actually went back to them, uh, kind of re-upped with them, and also used a small, I guess, small personal loan from a uh, lending club, one of those kind of crowdsourced uh, yep. uh, kind of companies. But yeah. um, I forget what the option they had was called, but it was basically a business loan, but requires personal guarantees and all that. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. you know, we're kind of putting ourselves on the line there, um, but cobbled those together with uh, money that we had to fund that second production order. Um, and that was the first one that actually started selling at, at some degree of velocity. Uh, and then we spent the next year, maybe even a bit more. Um, we basically placed one order with the factory. It would come into stock. We would sell it out uh, at first in a few weeks, and then eventually in like a day or two. Um, take that money, place an order for double the size, and then just kind of keep repeating that process until we got to the point where we could afford enough uh, units to be in stock for the time of production and, and shipping so that, you know, we didn't sell gotcha. out every time we got inventory. Gotcha. So you guys would, would just go through these periods where there would be no, no inventory left on the site because you guys would sell out of it before another production run could be, could be finalized. Yeah. So in 2014, we were sold out for like six months in total, not, not wow. six uh, in a row, but you know, if you add them up, it was basically like at first we'd get a, you know, inventory in, it would at least last a few weeks. And then we got to the point, a couple of the orders were gone, like the day they, uh, the day they arrived on the website. So that's why I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier that we were also kind of helped by accidental scarcity. It's uh, not artificial scarcity. It was very real, yep. but, uh, you know, we didn't intend to do it, but it did create a lot of demand. So when stuff came in, people were like, you know, as soon as we sent out the email that we had inventory, people were, uh, were on the site and, and buying. So is that, and that, that was going to be my next question is you guys were mainly just taking, you guys weren't even taking pre-orders. You were just acquiring email addresses uh, to be notified once new, new product was in stock. And then you'd send out a notification email, then people would come and buy up all the stock that had just been, been released. Yeah, we did a little bit of pre-selling around this time. I think with maybe the first shipment just to start uh, getting money into the business and, uh, you know, gauging the demand. Um, but for the most part, we didn't because whatever we were getting in, we we're selling out anyway. And pre-sales were just adding to the complexity of like, yep. uh, back then it was a little trickier. We had a second system for managing that. Then we'd have to copy everything over to, uh, to Shopify or maybe to our 3PL. Um, but it was adding all this overhead to like sell units we were going to sell anyway. So, um, you know, we were just making different groups of people mad with us, <laughs> whichever one we chose. So at what point, so again, kind of looking at these deflection points, you know, you went to this period of sort of, you know, stagnating between having inventory, not having inventory and selling out. What, at what level of revenue did it take you to get at where you were able to then fund all of your inventory purchases and production runs uh, and maintain, you know, product in stock on the site all at the same time? So it was more, it was less a function of that and more a function of, how many units we could afford to do in an order. And if those units would last us the, say, three months uh, uh, between production and uh, shipping uh, into our warehouses. So it was once we got up, at that point, it was probably an order for maybe 2,000 units, maybe 2,500, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. uh, that we finally had an order that would last us for a few months rather than a few hours. Um, so that's when we kind of like, kind of finally got to a nice point where it was like, 
money could be coming in uh, every day rather than, you know, one day and then sold out for three months. Um, but then also, you know, would be able to place those reorders too. I guess, I mean, maybe I'm asking the question wrong, but in what size the business had to, had to get to, right? What size were you at? And I, that's why I said revenue that you were able to fund that large of a production run in order to make that happen though. Like, I'm just trying to think, so people that are, you know, that are maybe in the same boat trying to scale, um, it, what size did the business have to get to before that was, you were able to do that and fund it with profits? Um, so we were always doing that, uh, I guess, in terms of actually being able to keep it in stock. We were probably doing, well, that year we probably did six figures uh, gotcha. at least. Okay. Um, and that was more of a function of demand, right? If we were selling yep. uh, you know, fewer units per day or something, we could have done that at 500 or a thousand units. Got but, it. Um, you know, the, the supply and demand were not growing, uh, in concert at that point. Sure. Uh, so okay. they finally got there. Gotcha. Okay. And then how did you guys think about, so it, it did pretty much all profit go into funding inventory purchases or did you guys allocate a certain amount of that profit to, you know, were you guys still working sort of side jobs or how did you allocate profit knowing, okay, we need to put this percentage of profit towards inventory purchase versus this amount of profit towards marketing versus salaries, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Until, until we had uh, like constant stock, uh, everything was going back into uh, into inventory, except for the like the few software things that we had to have, like Shopify or something. Um, but yeah, I was still doing some uh, consulting and freelance on the side. Uh, Jeremy was when we started the business. Uh, my co-founder Jeremy was in film school, so he was doing like producing some uh, commercials and things like that uh, on the side. And even once uh, we started making a little bit of money, we basically kept uh, kept all of it in the business. We didn't take a salary. We didn't hire anybody yet. We we're just trying to get to uh, that um, that point where the supply and demand were in some level of sync initially before mm-hmm. we thought about doing anything else. Because at that point, uh, you know, we I don't want to say we needed less demand, but you know, we didn't need to spend on marketing. That was that would exacerbate the problem, right? Rather than fix it. Right. So right, um, right. Yeah, we finally we kind of put off salaries until our uh, accountant told us. We needed to take them or it would start to look fishy uh, to the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So then was there any point after that where you decided to go out and, and take out a loan or anything to start funding inventory? Or, or have you guys been able to fund inventory runs uh, with profit ever since? Uh, so once we actually had a track record, then we were able to do uh, pursue more traditional uh, forms of financing. So we have a line of credit uh, with our bank, um, which we use for uh, for inventory. And uh, we also have an option, um, you may be familiar with that now, basically any, any big company that touches e-commerce now also wants to loan you money. So that yep. includes Shopify, PayPal, right. like every single one of those companies. Uh, but with so very high rates some, though. Yes, often very high rates. It's kind of uh, hidden in the way they manage the the payback. Um, the payback is very nice and convenient. They can just you know sort of take it out of the money that's coming in because you know they have access to all of that, but um, it sort of obscures uh, the, the rates they're charging you. Mm-hmm. Um, so we uh, we have access to some, I guess, through all of those technically, but um, we've used some through Flexport, uh, who is our freight forwarder. Uh, they have a little bit better. Uh, better rates than some of the others because, Got it. Uh, you know, they just kind of have a handle on, on what you're shipping and when, uh, versus, you know, some of the others, uh, have, have different data. So, um, we've used them a bit, uh, it's kind of a new product for them, but, uh, it's nice because it's kind of integrated in, in everything we're doing on the freight side. Uh, so, you know, as we go to, to pay for freight that we're shipping with them, we can also use them to finance it if we need to. Very cool. And it, it, what? how long did it take you guys to have a track record um, in order to start using these outside capital sources? Uh, so most banks will want uh, at least two years of profitability. Um, okay. Those don't have to be huge years, but, you know, they kind of want to see that that's sort of the minimum threshold. If, you know, let's say that first year you're fairly profitable or just by a bit, and then you show some good growth in that second year, um, that's probably enough. It doesn't have to be, you know, two years of, uh, huge success or giant margins or anything like that. But, uh, yeah, it's generally two years of profit, uh, kind of a starting point. And then, you know, you, you can kind of negotiate with them from there as to like, you know, what's going to come next or 
you know, why that first year wasn't as profitable as it could be. And, you know, year three is going to be much more uh, profitable. So you can kind of tell them a story beyond that. But if you don't have those two years, they're, the conversation of this uh, generally doesn't even start. So and what I'm trying to extract is, you know, for, for brands that do want to bootstrap um, and, and want to go that route, sort of what is the, what's the hurdle um, you know, the biggest hurdle or the hurdles you have to overcome to when all of a sudden it just starts to get a lot easier. And it sounds like, you know, from your experience, once you're able to get access to that line of credit from a bank, um, uh, then, you know, the ability to, to fund inventory becomes a lot easier. Then you can start plowing profits back into things like marketing and salaries versus just inventory purchases. But to get there, you really have to be able to showcase a couple years um, or so, right, of profitability in the business. So you've got to be able to, to figure out how to fund inventory and fund your livelihood and, and yourself up until you get to that point of a couple years of profitability, right? Yeah, I think, uh, I'm sure that's probably scary to a lot of people, right? You think if you're... Uh kind of scraping along for two years that that creates some openings and opportunities for, you know, for someone else to copy you and raise money or pers- right. pursue a different path and, you know, kind of lap you by the time you you're qualified. So um, yeah, that's, that's a big part of the challenge that there's not really um, there aren't really good options for people just starting out. You know, this is why a lot of people are, they start out on Kickstarter now because from day one, you know, you can't get any money through, uh, traditional banks or financing or any of that. Um, even the stuff we talked about a minute ago, Shopify and PayPal, like if you don't have a track record, they don't have anything to base uh, uh, their loans on. So yeah, you're, you're kind of out in the cold for those uh, first two years. So that's when it becomes important to either, uh, you know, if you have some, some money you've saved and can put towards it, that's great. Starting as small as you can using Kickstarter. Like we didn't, we didn't use it to start, but uh you know, I totally understand why why people do, and I can imagine us using it for for some purpose in the future. So let's let's sort of shift gears a little bit because I think and I think that was really helpful and insightful in terms of how to think about capital and those inflection points. You know, when you're when you're bootstrapping, um, I think the other other big piece that that comes into play, a couple of big pieces that come into play when when you aren't raising outside capital is, and, and the biggest one is then marketing. Uh, and it sounds like for the early days, you guys really relied on a lot of content production, uh, blogging, uh, sort of audience building, but in a very organic way over a few years to, to build up that demand. How has that changed, you know, today? Sort of, you know, I know you guys are doing in, in, in sort of the mid seven figures of revenue. And, um, you know, after you hit that first million, you know, did your marketing playbook change or have you guys been, you know, pretty much sustained and, and, and been growing through content all along? Uh, we do more things now in terms of marketing, but uh, we've never hit a point where we decided like, all right, now we're going to spend a ton of money on performance marketing, uh, which okay. is what a lot of the VC funded brands do. Yep. A lot of that money is basically going into uh, salaries like uh, traditional tech investment and, uh, even more is going to to Facebook and Google Um, because, you know, if VCs are giving you millions of dollars, they're not interested in waiting two or three years while your content strategy comes together and grows. Uh, (laughs) They want to see that, that huge growth every single month, not even just year over year. Um, So, you know, without some of those constraints that lets us uh, build up some strengths uh, elsewhere, but a lot of, a lot of our playbook in, in continuing to grow, um, the way I think about it is, uh, what can we add that is reinforcing or growing what we're already doing, or potentially even removing a barrier to growth of what we're doing, rather than just adding, constantly just adding new channels, new things to manage, more work to do, things that are not additive to what we're already doing. Um, I want to kind of keep growing what we are doing. So right now, for example, we're in the big, we're in the midst of a big uh, reboot on our blog. Um, and trying to take that to to kind of the next level, improving some of the content, uh, doing more of our own photography, maybe even videography there, um, adding depth to some of the product recommendations and buyer's guides that we do. So uh, we're often looking at things like leveling up what we already do, or you know, sometimes it's increasing the volume or more posts or longer posts, whatever makes sense strategically rather than always just adding new channels and, okay, now we're doing Snapchat and now we're doing Instagram stories and just piling more things on top. Um, We're trying to be, have some uh, diversity of of channels and and traffic and all that. 
um, but also uh, keep reinvesting in what's already working as opposed to just adding new things. So do you guys do any performance marketing today? We do, but it's fairly small. So we do Google shopping and a bit of remarketing. Um, but uh, that's uh, a fairly minor um, piece of our marketing uh, investment. Okay. And like what, what percentage do you think of your marketing investment goes towards performance? If you just had to, maybe, you know, but if you had, to, if you don't, if you had to guess. Uh, I don't know, but I guess that's relatively expensive versus some of the other stuff we do. Um, Got it. Maybe a, a quarter or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, and because I, I love that it's, and, it's a, a, a fraction of the overall it, playbook. Yeah. And, and time wise, it's, uh, it's like, dwarfed by everything else that we do in terms of our, our actual focus and time we put into it. Right. Right. Um, okay. Well, very cool. So, and you mentioned you guys are doing a few things, you know, and it sounds like you're doubling down on what's worked in the past, which is content. What, what would be some of those other things you guys have been doing or trying beyond just, you know, the blog and the content and, and sort of the small amount of performance marketing spend you do, what are the other channels or the other things you've tested or used recently that have seemed to work really well? Yeah. So the other one, uh, and this is, uh, in some ways I think about it as an extension of our content strategy, but, uh, we also do a lot of work with affiliates. Okay. Um, and that can range from, uh, travel bloggers. There are tons of people who document their travels, um, and also, you know, review the products they're using. Um, that can range from them to we've, we've sponsored some podcasts, which also kind of works like an affiliate program. Um, uh, a lot of the, what used to be magazines are now basically online publishers that are very heavy on affiliate revenue. So, um, you know, where at one time, maybe you would use PR to try to get placement in a magazine. Um, now you're pitching that, uh, that same publication to include you in a product roundup or review. Uh, and then they're using affiliate links. Um, so a lot of what, what traditionally had been publishing is now, kind of a part of, uh, the affiliate marketing world. Yeah, that's funny. It's well, it's you know, everybody in media is trying to figure out how to monetize. Right. And so it's, it's been a, there's been a large push, you know, for especially these smaller sort of niche public niche publications in the travel space that you know, they're making a lot of that revenue off of affiliate, you know, commerce sales. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it's a great opportunity for you guys to then be able to leverage those, those audiences. Um, how about, you know, influencers, you say affiliates, do you sort of wrap influencers into affiliates? Is that sort of the same thing as the way you guys see it? Uh, for our purposes, yes, uh, because we're typically, typically working with people who aren't, uh, aren't always social media first or aren't just social media influencers. So most mm -hmm. of the people that we work with have been, uh, longer term relationships and we try to be like, work together as closely as we can. So, you know, some bloggers just want to write one review and then move on to the next product. That's totally fine. Um, but we also have people we've been working with for years and maybe they started as an affiliate and then now we're sponsoring their podcast and, you know, if they do a giveaway. We, we contribute a product and, you know, there's a little bit more of that. Like every time we, either of us finds an opportunity, we, we kind of work together there. So that's kind of more the people that have, have worked well for us to partner with rather than like, Hey, social media influencer, here's a bag. Will you post about it one time and tag us? Like we don't really do do any of that. Um, we try to go kind of deeper relationships and they're often a little closer to, to an affiliate kind of setup. Okay. That makes sense. So the, the other thing I wanted to, to talk to you about specifically, because again, it goes a little bit with your, you know, your sort of bootstrapped and contrarian mindset with how to scale a brand is, is the team. So I know you guys operate a, a fully remote team and I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you've structured that. And was that built on purpose? Was it just built by sort of opportunity? That's how you found folks or what's, what is your sort of specific philosophy on remote versus non-remote teams? Yeah, it started accidentally and then moved to uh, on purpose. Right. Uh, so when we were starting, uh, like I mentioned before, we're starting the business on the side. Uh, I was living in San Francisco. My co-founder, Jeremy, was in L.A., uh, but we've known each other for years, so it was no, no problem for us uh, working remotely. Then uh, we started uh, using freelancers for some certain tasks, like designing the first bag, things like that. Um, and then... So by the time it came time to actually add employees, even just 
part-time, uh, kind of more regular freelancers initially. By then, we were already pretty used to it, and we're still doing it on the side. So it wasn't like, all right, now we're getting serious. We're renting our office, and everyone has to be here. We're already pretty comfortable with it, and everyone we were adding was either part-time or freelance. So it still felt like we could we could continue what we we're doing, and it, it didn't feel like a huge decision at that point. Um, it felt like a decision, but not like something we could never turn back from, or um, you know, was really. Uh, enshrined at that point. Um, but then as we grew the, some of those people into full-time employees and wanted to add other full-time employees, uh, it became something that we did codify in our values as uh, we work remotely and there are drawbacks and, and downsides to it. But we've decided that you know this is a core value for us. So uh, we're willing to live with those things and we'll do our best to navigate around them. So it started kind of by accident or circumstance and then became uh, something that's like really core to, to what we do and, and how we work and what we believe about, about work. How do you guys get around some of those downsides? I'd be curious to, to, to understand from your perspective what you think the biggest downside is and then how do you guys mitigate that? Uh, so the biggest downside generally or the biggest challenge, let's say, uh, is communication. Um, you lose a lot, of course, by not just sitting next to someone, overhearing mm -hmm. conversations, um, just being able to grab someone and ask them uh, about a thing or, uh, you know, let's say a different team uh, in the company is having a conversation. Maybe you learn something just because it's in the air. So uh, you do have to intentionally build, build in communication structures and build them in so that they work well with remote work. So, for example, a lot of them need to be asynchronous if people are in different time zones. Um, because, you know, you can't just have a full conversation on Slack right now and make a decision because another teammate who may need to be part of that decision-making process is in bed right now. So uh, you do have to design it intentionally there. The biggest challenge, or I guess the biggest uh, extra challenge uh, for a physical product company is dealing with a physical product. So um, what we lose, which uh, is, is kind of an extension of this communication issue, is we we rarely, at least, uh, I don't want to say never, but we rarely are able to, let's say, receive a sample of a new product and all gather around a conference table and talk about what's working on it and, and what's not and what we might right. want to change. Yeah. So um, we mitigate this in a few ways, but uh, it's definitely still not perfect. Um, so we do try to time some of our uh, reviews, whether it's uh, reviewing early samples or sharing new products with uh, the rest of the team. We try to tie some of that to uh, when we are together in person, whether it's a company-wide retreat uh, or we have some other uh, times when different parts of the company get together, like conferences. Um, we'll try and have some stuff together in person then so we can look at it and discuss. Um, and we spend a lot of money with FedEx and the Postal Service uh, shipping stuff around because uh, we're not always all in one place look at something together. So uh, that's another thing that we have to do asynchronously. So, you know, one person might, let's say we're, we're trying four ideas for a new product. One person might get those four bags. Uh, they check them out, test them, do their review, and then they ship it on to the next person. So some Got of it. that ends up happening asynchronously, which, uh, you know, in some ways makes us move slower at that stage. but we're still small enough that, you know, we can move fast to other stages and, and be far ahead on our development so that uh, if we're moving slowly with that new product, that's fine because, you know, we've got uh, two years of other stuff in the pipeline ahead of it. And you mentioned just general like day-to-day -day asynchronous communication being key with, with team members around the world and different time zones. Give me an example. Like how do you guys structure communication to be asynchronous, you know, asynchronous on like a day-to-day -day basis? So some of it is in the tools, like uh, we use Asana as our project management um, tool, and that's kind of our our in the cloud place that is the one source of truth. So you know if you're involved in a project, project and need to know where uh, the rest of the project is, where the person who's finishing something before you, you know, are they done with it, and can I start my part? Um, that's where you check it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, of course, operates you know asynchronously, uh, and we try to use that rather than people asking like, "Hey, where's that deliverable? I need it now. Um, yep. Have you finished it?" Right. Um, so we move uh, to having a, a single source of truth like that, so people can answer their own questions and, and find that information. Um, and then some of it is also just the uh, 
I guess, cultural norms around using other tools. So Slack, for an example, um, we want to be careful about either one, expecting people to reply instantly on Slack. Like if someone sends me a message, but I'm out at lunch, like that's fine. I'll answer it when I get back. Or if your head's down on a project for, you know, half a day, that's fine. Answer the question later. So uh, between, um, between just expectations of replies and also what is discussed on Slack versus elsewhere, uh, we try to create the expectation that Slack should be asynchronous. So if someone, um, let's say, starts a conversation that, you know, you may need a certain group of people to participate in, maybe they're online right then, maybe not. Um, because of time zones or whatever else, um, that's when you know we we try to make sure someone else notices that and points it out and says, "Hey, let's move this to you know our next call on Friday, or let's move this to email so everyone can have their input, even if it's not all at the same time." So you know we're all guilty of occasionally like starting a conversation there, or sometimes it accidentally gets to that point in Slack, but that's when we have to say like, "Hey, let's let's take this to a different medium because." Um, you know, even with healthy norms around chat, it still lends itself to being uh, kind of expecting instantaneous reactions. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's a hard thing to do. Um, we have a number of our, you know, our team that, that operates remote. Um, and then, so I'm always curious just how other remote teams operate specifically around day-to-day communication. Cause I would agree. We, we do the same exact same thing you do in a lot of cases, but sometimes it can get, uh, it can go off the rails when, when it comes to things like Slack. Um, so last, last sort of thing here to, to sort of move us towards wrapping up, um, because I know you know, specifically talking about sort of funding, uh, and going the bootstrap route, talking about how to manage remote team and you guys uh, do things very differently than I think, um, at least I know from a lot of other brands either we work with or that we know or that we've interviewed before in the podcast. And I, I love hearing that perspective. So it did kind of build on that. What I'd like to know is sort of what your advice would be, you know, for another brand that is, for example, you know, maybe they just hit their first million in revenue, uh, and they're trying to figure out, okay, now we're going to be go from here. We've seen traction, there's clearly demand, uh, but we need to, you know, we need capital infused into the business in order to scale, maybe at the pace we want to scale. What would you recommend to them in terms of how to think through making that decision? Because I'm assuming there were probably courses and points along the way where you had to decide not to go out and raise, you know, VC, right? And you said, you know, we're going to bootstrap, you know, we're never going to raise. Um, sort of how did you guys make that decision and what advice would you give to other founders that are maybe trying to cope through or, or struggle with making the same choice themselves? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, it was uh, never that tempting to us um, yeah. because we're coming from a place where uh, we wanted to have a functional business. I, I mentioned we started out with the idea of like, you know, the small kind of passive income sort of thing. Um, so we've scaled up our ambitions from there, but we're always way more content to be a small business that uh, was healthy and profitable and all of those things uh, than, you know, as big as it could be or making as much money as possible. We were always more uh, closer to like base camp, the company um, and some of mm-hmm. their, their ethos than, you know, whatever uh, VC funded version uh, you want to say. So <laughs> sure. uh, in some ways it was never tempting for us, but that was because of what we wanted to build. So if you do want to build a, a company like that or, you know, a certain size or uh, growing at a certain rate, then, you know, some of that money may be inevitable. I think the, the VC funded side of, uh, of retail, direct to consumer, whatever you want to call it, I think they are starting to come around to a little bit more sensible amounts of funding. At first, there was tons of money going into these uh, brands. VCs were expecting, you know, tech companies sort of multiples, but right. not really possible with physical products. So, uh, like you alluded to earlier, a lot of them had uh, bad exits, maybe a lot of money, but technically a bad exit for, for VCs and stuff. So uh, I think the amounts of money are starting to come down and, and the expectations are starting to change. So that may actually be a less, less damaging route in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I guess, like with working remotely, it's the sort of thing that we decided and just said, there are going to be downsides and tough times because of this choice, but we're going to make this decision and live with those. You know, it just depends what kind of, uh, what kind of pain points you want to have um, and if you're willing to live with them. So yeah, if, if someone is interested in pursuing that route, um, 
I, I think the priorities have to be on what gets you there rather than, you know, rather than what is, what is what everyone is talking about at the moment. So if everyone is talking about, you know, performance marketing, but to stay profitable, you don't have the money to do that, then you have to go against the grain or be willing to ignore what, um, you know, all the companies that are actually getting the press are doing. You have to focus on what is actually working for you and, and what is profitable for you and you can afford. Um, that's been a, it's kind of a muscle. I think you have to de- develop. Everyone follows, you know, whatever's going on with the big name companies or the, you know, Caspers or away or whatever, but, um, what is working for those companies who are operating in a totally different context is often not what is going to work for you. So you have to kind of focus on what is working for you and optimizing your business rather than trying to like emulate these other companies. And we've, we've made these mistakes. I don't mean to say that, uh, that I am immune to it or anything. We've, we've certainly gone down those routes and then had to realize, um, that we have gotten off track of what people wanted from us and what we're good at and, and had to backtrack some of that. So, um, yeah, I, I think that'll be kind of the starting point. I know that doesn't answer like where to get more money, but, uh, I think that's the the mindset that will kind of take in the right direction. No, I love it. I think it's great. Well, Fred, I think this was, this was really good. This is really helpful and insightful. Again, it's a, it's a totally different perspective than I think a lot of people hear. And I, and I think that's great because then you can now have more knowledge and sort of decide how you want to scale, uh, whether that's more of a bootstrap mindset or, or going out and, and seeking outside, you know, actual sort of, you know, funded capital, you know, venture capital. Um, so Fred, thanks for coming on the show, man. This was, this was really helpful and, and hopefully we can, we can touch base, you know, later on and see how things are going with you guys and, and have another conversation. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, if anyone's interested in pursuing any of these uh, weird paths that we've taken, please, uh, please reach out. I'm, I'm happy to help. And that was going to be my last question is where's the best place for people to find you? Yeah. So to find me, I'm either at uh, on Twitter at, at Fred Parada, two R's and two T's uh, or Fred There's a contact form there. If you want to email me. Awesome. And then Tortuga backpacks is it just Tortuga that's it. Awesome. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to check you guys out too. Cause again, my, uh, my, my past traveler, uh, persona is, uh, is, is super interested. So I've got to see what you guys got going on. Anything new, anything new released or anything new I need to check out specifically? Uh, yeah, you might want to check out. So, uh, kind of depends on your travel style. So we have a few different collections. Um, so, uh, the most recent product we released was a women's fit. So I'm guessing that's not what you need. Um, <laughs> but you probably want to check out either the set out backpack or the outbreaker backpack. Um, cool. those are kind of our, our larger bags, uh, higher capacity, and then just, uh, just depends what features and, uh, and materials you like. Awesome. I'll check them out. All right, Fred. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. Bye. Hey crew. It's Alan Bird again. And real quick before you go. Would you like a weekly digest of what's working today in the world of consumer-facing e-commerce? Every week, our team of strategists compile a single email with growth strategies and operations tactics that help you stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the competition. Think of it as the brand operator's cheat sheet. Just head over to thecommercelab.com to sign up.